Welcome everyone. Welcome to the today's ICANX talks. Uh, so it's uh, my great pleasure to chair the today event. Uh, my name is Paolo Samori. I am professor in physical chemistry at the University of Strasbourg in France. Uh, interested in nanochemistry, 2D materials, uh, uh, printed electronics, organic electronics. Uh, but I like to go faster to the main actors and heroes of today. Uh, well, actually, this is a rich month that uh, already uh, has a schedule of five different lecturers uh, that you can see in front of you. So we just had a few days ago Andrea Alou from New York. Uh, today is Patrice Simon. Kyle Ketchpo uh, will follow very soon. So stay tuned and uh, let's uh, focus on today's lecture. So we have a, a very rich uh, uh, number of uh, uh, person in the in the panel and as a speaker, uh, as you can see, I will introduce one by one. Uh, so let's start with Patrice Simon. Patrice Simon, Professor Patrice Simon, is a today's uh, lecturer. Uh, Patrice Simon is distinguished professor of material science at the University of Toulouse, three Paul Sabatier. Uh, he received his PhD from the same university in 1996. He, Yes, served as director of the Alistor European uh, Research Institute uh, dedicated to lithium ion battery. That was a service that lasted as long as 10 years, so from 2008 to 2018. He's currently also leading uh, on the behalf of the French National Research Centers, CNRS, uh, uh, the National Strategy of Acceleration of Battery. So this is a very big program uh, that has been launched uh, at the beginning of 2023. He's also deputy director of the French Network for Electrochemical Energy Storage, uh, and this happened since its creation. So it's a big network that gathers 20 labs, 15 companies working on batteries and supercapacitor. Uh, so his research activity uh, focuses on fundamental understanding of uh, electrochemical processes, occurring materials electrolyte interfaces in electrodes uh, for, semi, uh, for electrochemical energy storage, uh, in particular. The focus is on batteries and electrochemical supercaps. And he published over 250 papers with uh, as many as 70,000 citations. Uh, he gave many lectures around the world. He got uh, a long list of uh, major awards and recognition, including uh, two different ERC, European Research Council uh, awards. Uh, he got RSC Horizon Prize in 2021, Conway Prize in electrochemistry in 2018, uh, last Nano Prize in 2015 that he shared with one of our panel members, Yuri Gogossi. He was awarded the Silver Medal of CNRS. And uh, I'm just not going to continue the long list because otherwise we can stay here until tomorrow. Uh, he, uh, not surprisingly, he is among uh, the highly cited uh, uh, researcher from Clavier Analytics since 2016. He's also a member of uh, major academies of science, so the French Academy of Science, national one the French Academy of Technology uh, and the European Academy of Science, and also was member of the Institut Univers Francais, both as junior and senior. So I think that uh, this introduction gives you a feeling of the uh, major contribution that Patrice has been given to the field of electrochemistry at the nanoscale. And that is actually the title of his lecture, Electrochemistry at the Nanoscale, Application to Materials for Energy Storage. Patrice, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Paolo, for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. Um, so let's, okay, let me pick up my slides. Okay. Okay. Great. So I would like to, uh, to thank really uh, sincerely for the very uh, kind invitation to, to join this series of seminars. So the title of my talk, as Paolo mentioned, is Electrochemistry at the Nanoscale Application to Materials for Energy Storage. So basically, I will start by a, a very brief introduction about the context. So in Europe, there is about 39 projects of plants, gigafactory plants, gigafactory for battery production, for about uh, 1850 gigawatt hour uh, in 2030. So 33 different companies uh, are currently uh, uh, designing plants. And you will see this is a kind of map of all these companies. So just to let you know that the, obviously the, the battery topic is uh, is uh, very hot by this day, but I guess that uh, I know that all of you are aware about that. 
And in France, we have three main gigafactories which are currently uh, under construction. And one is Envision from China, the uh, second one is ACC from Total, and number one from, from uh, Verco as well. Okay. So, um, as Paolo uh, just recently introduced, my, uh, my research activities are mainly dedicated to uh, electrochemical energy storage devices. So, here is a Ragoni plot for specific power versus specific energy density. And you can see that here batteries lie in the uh, low uh, power, high energy density part, while electrochemical capacitors are complementary devices because they can reach high power with limited energy density. So to reach this uh, uh, this, this star here, which is uh, uh, co which corresponds to high power, high energy storage devices, if you start from super caps, electrochemical double layer capacitors, you just want to increase the energy density. And I will show you an example of how you can do that by trying to understand better how ions transfer adsorbs into nan nano-sized pores of carbon. A second option is to start from the battery uh, device, from battery world, and to try to increase the power density of batteries. And I will give you examples uh, how to control the kinetics of redox reaction in the bulk uh, or uh, in the materials to try to design materials with non-diffusion limited redox reactions. So we'll start by supercapacitors or electrochemical double layer capacitors. So these are high power devices for power boost energy recovery applications. There is no redox reaction in supercap. You just simply store the charge by ion adsorption onto high surface area carbons. So this is a sketch of the double layer. You have positive carbon electrodes, second uh, negative uh, carbon electrode. And when you polarize your positive electrode, when you inject holes into a carbon, you simply absorb anions on the, of the electrolyte on, into a carbon pores. And this is a, a molecular dynamic sketch where you see the carbon, the ions, the second electrode, the ions. And you can see that ions simply absorb onto the carbon uh, surface. And then by doing that, you charge here a layer of uh, a negative charge of the positive electrode, so from the electrolyte side. And you here you have a layer corresponding to a charge onto a carbon surface. You form a capacitor, and this capacitance is double layer capacitance. And this capacitance depends on the dielectric constant of the electrolyte and the approaching distance of the ion to the surface. These are about 10 to 20 microfarad per square centimeter. And if you use high surface area carbon, then you can reach more than 100 farads per gram of carbon. But here you can see that the charge storage is controlled by the ion dynamics, by the what happens at the interface between the carbon, porous carbon, and the electrolyte. So uh, briefly, what we do at the, at the lab, we assemble cells, we prepare porous carbon films, carbon plus binder, uh, and we, uh, we put a separator, electrolyte, and we assemble uh, stretch lock cells. You have examples here. You take electrolytes, which are non-aqueous electrolyte with acetonitrile here as a solvent, and then you run different kind of uh, 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 electrochemical tests, and the most two simple tests are the galvanostatic uh, cycling, which is you see the cell voltage versus time, constant current charge, constant current discharge. Obviously, uh, Q is C multiplied by V, so C is the current divided by D over DT. If the cycling current is constant, double layer constant, then means that the change, the, vol the voltage change linearly with time, and this is what you see here. And a second kind of test is what we call cyclic voltammetry. You run, uh, uh, you run a polarization between uh, a zero and uh, a maximum potential, that constant potential scan rate. And what you can see of a rectangular CV, because again, the current is capacitance multiplied by D over DT. If a double year constant, if the scan rate, potential scan rate is constant, then the current is constant and you have a rectangle. So keep in mind, rectangle is Faradic electrostatic storage and a kind of triangle is a capacitive storage under galvanostatic static condition. Years before, we, uh, we prepared with uh, uh, Professor Yui Gagotsi from Drexel University uh, so different porous carbons with different controlled pore size. So we started from TIC powder, and we did the chlorination at different temperatures. So that you remove the titanium through gas phase, and you end up with this carbon with holes, with pores. And by controlling here the chlorination temperature, if you measure the porous volume versus the pore size, you can see that you can prepare carbons with very narrow pore size distribution and extremely finely controlled pore size. Example of uh, 0.7 nanometer, 0.76, 1 nanometer. So the surface area is very high, more than 1200 square meter per gram, and you can control the pore size between below 1 nanometer, I would say. 
And we use this carbon to, uh, to uh, I would say, to test their electrochemical performance. And uh, years ago, what we found was if you plot the capacitance, normalized capacitance versus the pore size of a carbon in uh, non-acute electrolyte, what you what you what we observed was that when the carbon pore size was below one nanometer, which is less than the size of the solvated ions, the capacitance was increasing sharply. So the pores smaller than the solvated ion size were accessible to the ions, and by doing that, you can double the capacitance of your carbon. And we uh, proposed at that time, and we have we did a lot of work on that. We demonstrated that these nanopores were accessible thanks to the distortion, the parcel dissolvation of the ion. But recently, we were wondering if only the pore size matter. Is there other parameter which, which can also uh, contribute to improve, increase the capacitance beside on top of the pore size? So we prepared two different carbons, uh, still this carbide derivative carbon uh, that we use as model materials, one at 800 Celsius degree. You see, this is amorphous carbon. And the second one at 1100 Celsius degree, which is more graphitic. It's not graphite, it's more graphitic. But the beauty of these two carbons is that they have similar pore volume, this is the cumulative pore volume, uh, volume versus the pore sign, similar pore volume. And what you can see is that they have more or less the same pore size around 1.1 nanometer. Below 1.1 nanometer, more than 50% of the pore volume is, uh, can be achieved. So, if, we are, if I summarize, different structure, one amorphous, one more graphitized carbon, same porous volume, same pore size. And what we did, we used uh, an electrolyte, acetonitrile as a solvent, with EMI plus TFSI minus as the salt, which is a ethyl methylimidazolium trifluoromethylsulfonide ionic liquid, a well-known model electrolyte. And we ran cyclic voltmetries in this electrolyte for the amorphous carbon and the graphitic carbon. And you can see we have this uh, kind of uh, rectangular shape. So this is an electrochemical double layer uh, capacitive storage. You play with ion absorption and desorption into pores. Fine. Then what we did was to measure what we call the potential of zero charge. What is the potential of zero charge? It's a potential where there is no charge onto a carbon surface. It is defined by the minimum of the capacitance of a carbon uh, versus potential. What we observed was that the PZC, potential of zero charge of the graffiti carbon, was higher than the PZC of the amorphous carbon. How can we explain that? Simply by a spontaneous anion absorption, a strong interaction between the carbon surface and the anion in the case of a graffiti carbon, because in that case, when you put some electrolyte inside this, uh, uh, this graffiti carbon in the electrolyte, when anions can form strong interactions, chemist options, then you see that to neutralize the charge onto a carbon, you need to add holes, you need to positively polarize the carbon, and this is how, why your PZC is higher. Okay, so we have a carbon with strong anion absorption, even at open circuit potential, when it's graffiti. And then what we did was to use electrochemical quartz microbalance uh, technique to measure the ion dynamics into this pores. What it is? You take a piezoelectric quartz with a resonant frequency. On this quartz, you put a slurry, a small amount of slurry containing your porous carbon. And then you are going to use this quartz in a free electro electrochemical cell as a working electrode. And then you go and polarize your electrode. And each time you have a weight change onto the quartz, the quartz has a resonant frequency. Each time the weight changes or a weight change onto a quartz is associated through a solar bray equation to a change in the resonant frequency of a quartz. And by using the solar bray equation, you can deduce during the polarization what is a weight change onto into your carbon pores. And you have delta M, you have the cyclic voltammetry, you can calculate the charge Q, and you know that the Faraday's law, delta M divided by Q is proportional to a molar weight of a species. So this is what we did with amorphous and the graffiti carbon still in the same electrolyte, acetonitrile plus EMI TFSI. So this is a cyclic voltammetry I showed you before. But now what we were able to do is was to record the change of a frequency with the cyclic voltammetry for the amorphous carbon and the graffiti carbon. Still, we have adsorption, desorption. We have a frequency change, means that 
This frequency change corresponds to weight change of the carbon during the polarization because you put ions in, ions out, depending on the polarization. We have calculated the charge under the cyclic voltammetry during the cyclic voltammetry, and we have plotted the delta M from the delta F versus the charge. And this is, for example, what you obtain for the graffiti carbon. Delta M versus delta Q, the slope is proportional to the molar weight. Okay? So these dashed lines correspond to a theoretical plot you would obtain if, for instance, during negative polarization, all the charge is balanced by on, from the electrolyte side onto the carbon surface, you absorb only neat EMI plus ion corresponding to 111 gram per mole. Same for the positive charge. It's like if you, uh, this theoretical line corresponds to absorption of neat anions onto the carbon. What you can see in that case is that you have very symmetric here plots. Uh, a linear plot here, experimental linear plot, means that you play with anion absorption here, cation absorption here only. And here around the PCC, but anions are removed and cations are in, and uh, anions are in, cations are removed. So you have a kind of term break, uh, breaking the term selectivity. But this is a counter ion absorption mechanism. However, you can see here, Again, anions in for positive carbon. We inject negative charge in the carbon, cations in. However, for the, I would say, uh, more graffiti carbon, what you see is that we have a huge zone here around the PCC in this negative region where the mass change is close to zero. How can you explain that? You remember that the PCC of this carbon is higher, so we have strong anion interaction spontaneously onto the carbon surface. So before absorbing cations, you need to remove anion here. And you remove anions, you absorb cations, the weight change is very small, less than the theoretical one. And you have here a, a huge ion exchange mechanism just because you change the PCC of the carbon. And this ion uh, exchange zone is very important for instance, if you want to make some water desalination. If you want to make some capacitive desalination using porous carbon, you want to play with counter ion absorption mechanism, but not with ion exchange. So what is clear is that the local ordering of the carbon, because this is the only difference between the carbon, changes the PCC, and the PCC controls via ion fluxes. A second point, we made a step back because porous carbon is a bit complicated, so we use graphene materials. What we did, we uh, we uh, grew a, a single layer graphene onto carbon, and then we uh, we uh, put it, uh, we transfer the single layer graphene onto PET, and then onto a quartz. So we end up with a single layer graphene with coated onto a quartz of a, a, of a, a microbalance. And then we use this quartz as working electron in microbalance. This work was done with Professor Yomon Zhu from the USTC. And we did some characterization just showing that, yes, we have uh, this is a quartz and this is a, a, a AFM image of a graphene. So we have a small zone not covered, not coated, but yes, this is a, definitely a single year, uh, a graphene coated onto quartz. And then what we did, we did a cyclic voltammetry here and we did constant potential measurements. And at each constant potential, we recorded the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy to calculate the capacitance. And this is a change of a capacitance with a potential for different electrolytes. This is EMI TFSI 2 mol per liter in acetonitrile, neat EMI TFSI, and the bare gold quark <coughs> without any graphene layer. What you can see here now is that the PZC, the potential of zero charge, when you use solvent-free EMI TFSI, so there is no acetonitrile here, acetonitrile, so neat EMI TFSI, solvated EMI TFSI. When you remove a solvent of the acetonide of the electrolyte, you strongly decrease the PCC. It means that in neat ionic liquid, the single layer graphene sees strong interaction with the cation. And this is mainly due because of pi pi interactions between the uh, imidazolium and <coughs> I would say the uh, sp2 uh, uh, carbons of a single layer graphene. Then we did some EQCM measurements on single layer graphene in neat EMI TFSI. And this is the CV, and this is the frequency change during the cycle. We use the Serbre equation, and still, same, we plotted the weight change versus the charge during positive and negative polarization. What you can see here is that when you 
positively polarize the singular graphene, you have a weight decrease. A weight decrease means that a, a positively charged species is removed. And if you calculate the experimental molar weight, you end up with a formation, desorption of the EMI 1.58, FSI 0.58 plus cluster. And this cluster was predicted by uh, Cornichess group. So, more surprising is that when you go to negative charge, what you see is that there is no weight change. But if you remember, there is a capacitive storage, no weight change. How can you explain that? Simply, and this is a work that, uh, uh, again, this uh, was done by uh, at USTC. This is uh, simply explained by the strong interactions you have between the cation and the surface of the graphene. At the PZC, the, the, uh, at the open circuit potential, sorry, you have cations which are fixed, which are strongly chemisorbed onto the surface. And when you are going to inject negative charges into the graphene, these cations are going to orientate parallel to the surface to balance the charge. And this, this is the first example of, uh, I would say, a charge storage mechanism only by electrolyte reorganization locally on the surface of graphene. So it means that we play with the dielectric, local dielectric constant of the electrolyte just to explain this charge storage mechanism. So this is very interesting, obviously, because what we see is that there is no net ion fluxes, but a simple electrolyte reorganization. And now, if you move to two mole per liter EMI TFSI uh, single year graphene, what you see is that you go back to this counter ion absorption mechanism, which is again completely different from the situation where you have neat ionic liquid without solvent. So the presence of solvent changes radically the charge storage mechanism by simply screening the pi-pi interactions between the cation and the graphene layer. So not only the pore size, that would be the conclusion, but also the carbon local structure is very important for the capacitance of the carbon. And finally, to uh, conclude on this part, what we did was to try to uh, make a much short key analysis of this uh, uh, graphene electrolyte interface. So the you have two double uh, capacitance in series. One is a, a state charge capacitance here of the graphene, and the second is a double layer capacitance. And then, if you take the Mott-Schottky plot, uh, Mott-Schottky equation, you can easily model the, charge, the space charge capacitance from the graphene, and you can plot it versus uh, the potential, or uh, minus the PCC. And what you can see is that here, at the PCC, you have, if you inject negative charges, you increase the number of charge carrier density because this charge carrier density is, proportional, uh, is inversely proportional to a slope. And when you go to positive charge, still you increase the charge carrier density. So it means that a single layer uh, onto graphene, onto a gold, uh, gold quartz, you move from N-type to P-type behavior when you cross the PCC. And what is the space charge capacitance on a single layer graphene? In fact, you can use a gram model of the uh, double layer, which considers specifically adsorbed ions. This is a Grime-like model. And if you consider that those strongly adsorbed EMI plus cations, uh, uh, you can then define this space chart region uh, with a, a thickness in, that includes the thickness, obviously, of the single layer and the thickness of the first layer of cation strongly adsorbed. And then when you, what, what you see is that if you use solvated here, Elect, uh, EMI to FSI or need EMI to FSI, you change the charge carrier density onto the graphene layer. So the conclusion is that the space charge capacitance depends on both the graphene and the electrolyte. And this space charge capacitance is defined by the thickness, including the specifically absorbed cations in EMI plus uh, TFSI minus electrolyte. Okay. So finally, to conclude, uh, all this work. Uh, have been uh, obviously uh, <coughs> at some applications. And you can see that here, today, the supercapacitors, commercial products, they are about at seven watt hour, 15 kilowatt per kilogram. And uh, this company was using uh, this curve graphene, which are produced in DC. And uh, uh, now the performance is about 10 watt hour per kilogram uh, uh, compared to about, uh, it was, uh, I would say, three, four watt hour per kilogram in 2000, uh, 2005. So we made a huge progresses thanks also to this uh, confinement effect, partial deceleration, and so on. And I would say that this technology, this, this device, is could uh, reach about 15 watt per kilogram, which is high as uh, 
for for a capacitor in terms of energy density, but not that high compared to batteries. So how to improve? Maybe to try to improve would be to play with redox reactions, which are non not limited by diffusion. And I'm going to give you examples of uh, what you can do to, to do that. So this is a cyclic voltammetry of a porous carbon electrochemical double layer capacitor that we uh, that we already discussed, and the current is proportional to the scan rate. Here, this is a cyclic voltammetry of a redox material, a battery lithium ion battery material, which is a LiFePO4. So this is an integration of lithium into FePO4, where you have a biphasic system, LiFePO4, FePO4. You see the cyclic voltammetry with peaks, and these peaks are corresponds to a reaction limited by the diffusion. The peak current is proportional to square root of the scan rate, which is what we call the uh, Van der Waals equation. And so, in fact, you have a peak current proportional to square root of the scan rate, and a peak current in that case for capacitive storage proportional to the scan rate. This is diffusion limited re re reaction, non diffusion limited reaction, high capacity, limited capacity, high energy, low energy. Uh, I would say low power, high power. If you move to galvanostatic plot, you have exactly the same, but uh, in a different way. This corresponds, this peak corresponds to a plateau for the LFP, and this, uh, I would say, uh, rectangular shape to correspond to a linear change of the potential. Okay, now, now, years ago, Brian Conway introduced the concept of pseudo capacitance. What is a pseudo capacitance? Let's assume that you 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 want to have, you you observe uh, electrosorption of uh, 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 compound M uh, on, on a substrate M. You have electrosorption of M, uh, A plus that takes one electron to absorb onto a substrate. You can, I would say, describe this kind of reaction by using the Langmuir adsorption type it's the equation. Theta is the surface coverage, and uh, then you can express the potential versus versus the Langmuir law. And if you do the derivative of this, you can see that the capacitance, which is a kind of adsorption electro uh, electrosorption capacitance, changes with theta multiplied by 1 minus theta. And the potential, depending on theta, you can also have a change of the capacitance with the potential. But this is, a, I would say, a needle model. If you use a more realistic model, you can use a Framkin model. And this Framkin model includes a local interaction parameter, J, which is here. And this local interaction parameter, what is that? When J is zero, it's a franking model. You can see this is the theta versus a, this is the value of a pseudo capacitance C versus a potential. For G zero, you have a, a pseudo capacitance at a given potential. Okay. But when you consider uh, G positive, means that you have repulsive interactions between two atoms, which are two uh, uh, species A plus, which are adsorbed, they are repulsive. Then you can spread the capacitance over a broader range of potential. And this is this concept that Brian Conway generalized not from 2D materials to 3D materials. He includes, he, he, he proposed the concept of pseudo capacitance that he pioneered with the TIS2 material where he was playing with lithium intercalation in TIS2. And he ended up with a potential versus Q, this kind of sigmoid plot, and he proposed this equation with a potential versus x divided by 1 minus x, which is a number of lithium. And he replaced, in fact, theta with x. And he included this g, uh, he replaced the g parameter by h. And he included also, he included at that time, a p, which was an intercalation pressure parameter. But in fact, this is simply a generalization of a electrosorption capacitance on 2D electrode to a 3D material. And this is how the pseudo capacitance concept come, came. And you can see here, there is uh, not a single plateau, no phase change, and there is no diffusion limitation. And this concept was extended to ruthenium oxide material in sulfuric acid electrolyte. This is a cyclic voltammetry of ruthenium oxide in sulfuric acid. And you can see that it's a rectangular square, but you move from ruthenium plus four to plus three to plus two. And you, this can be explained still by playing with this kind of uh, uh, surface coverage uh, uh, and, uh, and interaction, lateral interaction, you can simply consider now that you have a series of uh, pseudo capacitance here because of different redox uh, state of ruthenium, and then you end up with a kind of rectangular CV with these bumps. So the key features for this pseudo capacitance, I would say, such as defined by Conway, is there a constant change of Q versus V, no phase change, and no diffusion limitation. And then 
working with this uh, kind of concept, which was a very hot topic uh, about 10 years ago, uh, following uh, uh, the work of uh, Yuri Gagotsi and Michel Barzou, who discovered muxin materials you are certainly familiar with, we use this muxin to play with these high-rate redox materials. So muxins, what are they? You start from the max phase like PA3, ALC2. So uh, uh, M is the early uh, transition element, A is uh, aluminum, uh, valvian torch, and X is carbon and nitrogen, and now other materials have been discovered. But you simply start from max is TA3 LC2, you etch in fluorine containing electrolyte, and you remove, in that case, you etch the aluminum, the A material, and you finish, you, fin you end up with muxine. So you prepare 2D materials here, but those 2D muxines are uh, surface terminated. And since you use LIF in sulfuric acid, the surface terminations are fluorine and uh, OH. And uh, uh, we did a, a, a few works with uh, with a group of Professor Rigotzi on that, and we have shown that in aqueous electrolyte, in sulfuric acid, you could intercalate proton, and that uh, uh, we're following the reduction of uh, titanium 3 into titanium 2, and you could achieve very high redox reaction rate, non-diffusion limited, and you could increase the capacity that you can recover. And uh, this is an example of uh, uh, what we obtain in sulfuric acid, this is a cyclic voltammetry. You can see at different scan rates, up to 200 millivolts per second. Still very nice, symmetric, and so on. This is a concept of surface redox capacitance. And you can see that we could reach 1,500 per cubic centimeter and up to 350 per gram. So I would say that the volumetric capacitance was 10 times higher than carbon, and the gravimetric capacitance was three times the one of carbon. So very high CG, very high CV. But is it the solution? The point is that we use aqueous electrolytes, so we have the energy density which is limited because of a voltage window, a narrow voltage window uh, due to water electrolysis. So finally, those materials, uh, those vaccine materials produced with from LIF and HL, so containing fluorine and OH and O termination groups, were not really active in non-aqueous electrolytes. So what we did was to try to uh, think about how to tune the, react the surface chemistry of a vaccine, because obviously the electrochemical activity, we suppose that this electrochemical reactivity was driven by the surface groups. And we tried to find a new way to produce, to prepare vaccines. And this was done in collaboration with Professor Ting Huan at uh, uh, Ningbo. And this is a vaccine synthesis in molten salt electrolytes. So you take a KCL and an ACL, you heat at 750 degrees, and you put VHN. VHN is copper chloride. Copper chloride is going to reduce, and you are going to oxidize the A element, which is silicon here, into silicon 4 plus, while copper 2 plus is going to be reduced into copper. And this is how you can etch those materials. And if you uh, do the uh, characterization by XRD, this is the max phase. This is a muxine after this step. So you see that there are some copper peaks. And then to remove those copper peaks, we have washed with ammonium persulfate. And then you can see that after you have 00L sequence peaks with, uh, without the presence of copper. The SCV made show you that this is an accordion like structure expected from the clean. And we did DMS, ICP, and elemental analysis. And the formulation, the composition of our muxines were. CA3 1.9 or 1.7, CL 0.76 machine. So these these are free or free, OH free, CA3 C2 machine. This was checked by, by uh, uh, I would say, a TPDMS. Also, one thing interesting is that you can generalize this synthesis route just by playing with a redox potential of the Lewis acid, copper chloride, and so on, and the A element you want to remove. So just to show that a lot of materials can be prepared in that, uh, using this uh, molten salt route. Now, what about the electrochemistry? Here, I show you the regular the electrochemistry of the muxine material prepared from HF etching, so the conventional muxine. So this is lithium PF6 in ECDMC electrolyte. What you can see, the cyclic voltammetry, is that you have a second you have peaks, so diffusion limited reaction, corresponding to lithium intercalation in slits of different sizes. So this is a second shell lithium intercalation, but moreover, this is spread over three volts. So it means that this is not a good anode or nor a good cathode because the redox potential is too high for an anode and too low 
for a cathode because of three volt voltage range. What about our materials prepared from molten salt without fluorine, uh, sorry, without fluorine, without OH groups? This is our uh, material. So this is a the chlorine terminated mucin. And you can see that we have a very symmetric CV. First, no, diff no peak, no diffusion limitation, high capacity about 200 milliamp per hour per gram, and all the redox reactions occur between 0.1 and 2 volt. So this was a very nice, high, uh, I would say, potentially high energy and high power uh, material with no, again, uh, peak diffusion peak corresponding to diffusion limitations, as you can see from the cyclic voltammetry, which looks mirror-like. And then if you compare the power performance, this is a conventional mectin, and this is a change of capacity with a cycle number, a different C rate. One C corresponds to one charge during one hour, one discharge during one hour. So 0.1 C is 14 hours. So as you can see at one C, you are about, you can end up with about 140 million per program. And again, between zero and three volts. If you compare with our chlorinated, terminated, chlorine terminated mucine, then you can see that at 100 C, 100 C, we still, we can still deliver 100 million per program. So it means that within 36 seconds, you can charge, discharge and recover 100 million per program. This is definitely a high power material with 200 million per gram uh, uh, capacity at low discharge current. So it means that it's four times uh, uh, higher, five times better than porous carbon. And then what we did was to try to understand what happened, why to explain the reason of this high power performance. What we did was to, uh, uh, I would say, track the position of the zero zero to peak by XRD during the lithiation delitation. So this is a Potential resistance. So this is reduction, deletion, 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 and this is a change of zero zero to peak position during the cycling. What you see is first the zero zero d <coughs> zero zero two sorry peak position corresponds to this spacing value of eleven amshrine. So it means a C parameter of uh, twenty two amshrine. But there is no real change during the lithium intercalation. And how to explain that? So this was done before. Uh, 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 the, by modeling to, uh, to explain, uh, uh the, the confinement of the ions. This is the TF3C2, and these are the lithium. Uh, spacing, this spacing value of 11 amp shrink corresponds to about 3 amp shrink between the layers. So it means that within these 3 amp shrinks, you don't have room enough to put solvated lithium ions. And then all these lithium ions are mainly desolvated or partially desolvated. So it means that you, when you partially desolvate those lithium ions, then you can have fast lithium intercalation and high capacity. And based on those results, we try to uh, uh, have a view of what could happen uh, 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 of the reason of uh, this performance uh, improvement due to the confinement and the partial desolation and how we could uh, use those effects to propose new ways to new routes to design material. So let's give the example of a, a, a slit. Here, this is, a, I would say, interlayer distance, a very large interlayer distance where ions can go solvated with solvent molecules. So in that case, what you can do is that you can simply charge a double layer. It's, for example, this is a carbon, carbon, uh, a carbon, post carbon pore with big pores. All the ions go in with the solvent molecules. And you have high power, but it's electrostatic uh, uh, storage and the limited capacitance. Let's take the over complete extreme example where <clears throat> you have a, 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 a slit here between two, uh, two D materials. And when you can only intercalate ions fully dissolvated. This is, for instance, the case of lithium intercalation in graphite anode, or lithium intercalation in NMC material. It's a positive and negative electrode of a battery. In that case, there is a full redox charge transfer, high capacity, but low power because of diffusion limitation. Okay, on one side, big slits, we have absorption of solvated ions, electrostatic storage, low C, high power. On the extreme case, intercalation of desolvated ion, high capacity, limited power. And in between, but in between, what we propose is that here, when you 
decrease the size of a pore, or when you decrease the size of an interlinear distance, you are in between a fully solvated ion adsorption and or intercalation and fully desolvated ion intercalation. And you're in this zone where typically our new results on mucine uh, lie, where you see you have this kind of sym symmetric CV with high power performance with increased capacity compared to the double layer adsorption. And about 10 years ago, we obtained those results exactly in the same range for pore carbon where when <clears throat> the carbon pore size was very close to the ion size is this region, we observed these two redox peaks here. We are not redox, no charge, no change of, uh, 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 no uh, uh, electrolyte oxidation or carbon oxidation. And we proposed at that time that it was a kind of partial charge transfer from the ion into the carbon. And this perfectly makes sense and fits within this kind of, uh, uh, I would say, a uh, view. And what we can conclude on, what I can conclude on that is that this transition region between double layer and intercalation redox is a continuum and it offers new opportunities to prepare high power, high delivery, uh, high power delivery, sorry, high power uptake materials to prepare uh, the next generation of uh, high power, high energy density electrodes or high power batteries. So um, I would like to uh, uh, dedicate the last part of my talk for about uh, 15 minutes uh, to uh, a new technique that we recently developed to the lab, which is a, a new operando AC in-plane impedance spectroscopy. So what is that? There is, this is, a, I would say, a, a very basic experiment. I apologize for that, but you take a one kilo ohm resistance and you do the uh, impedance spectroscopy, like we call it impedance spectroscopy of one kilo ohm resistance. This is a model. This is a frequency. Obviously, this is completely flat, okay, in air. Next step, you put your resistance into an electrolyte. And you end up with this frequency, the module change. This is quite easy to explain because if you consider that you have an electronic branch, which is the resistance, in parallel with an ionic branch, which is the liquid electrolyte column between the two, uh, I would say, aluminum uh, uh, contactors. Mm -hmm. What you can see is that at very high frequency, the one kilo ohm resistance is short circuited by the ionic conductivity of the electrolyte here. But when the frequency decreases, obviously the electrolyte by itself, the impedance increases a lot. And then you are short circuited by the electronic branch at low frequency. So you can see that you move from ionic conductivity to pure electronic conductivity, ionic conductivity at high frequency, electronic conductivity at low frequency. Again, ionic and electronic branch in parallel. And this kind of very basic, simple experiment allows to distinguish between electronic, low frequency, ionic, high frequency percolations. Now, we try to uh, uh, design uh, 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 experiments where you take a insulating substrate and you quote, you coat, sorry, this insulating substrate with an active material field. It can be carbon, uh, LFP, and so on and so on. And then you are going to use two potential stars. The first potential star here is connected to its two, uh, I would say, gold pads. And with this first potential star, you are going to make some cycling voltammetry, some galvanostatic cycling in two or three electrode modes. And then using a second potential star here, connected here symmetrically to this first one, we are going this, to use this second potential star to make some in-plane electrochemical impedance measurements. So by this way, remember, this is an insulating substrate. All the current flowing through electron, through uh, solid phase electrons or liquid phase ions <clears throat> cannot flow through a current collector, is obliged to flow parallel to the surface in plane of the electron because the substrate is insulated. And this is a sketch of our working electrode. So this is a, a here the, the, the sample, and these are the gold uh, pads that we have de deposited, and around this is here the, uh, the couple. And what we have done, we have studied with this new technique, three different, four different materials. First, porous carbon, second, muxine, and then, so you see, this is a capacitive material. This is a high-rate redox material, photocapacitive like and two battery materials, one for sodium ion battery and one uh, LIFPO4, which is lithium ion battery material. 
Okay, so when we do, we when you say we, we study this material, in fact, we code a substrate with a film of those materials. Just uh, before going to a detail, to details, just a reminder, if you do a conventional electrochemical impedance spectroscopy of a two electrode double layer capacitor, you end up with this one. This is a out of plane AC impedance, okay, between two electrodes here. This is an Nyquist plot. And this Nyquist plot can be easily modeled by what we call the transmission line model, which is the what proposed by Delevy. Basically, this is a carbon and this is a pore, okay? So this is the current collector. And what you can say is that you can have uh, here the first adsorption site for the ion, so a capacitance, and then you go into the depth of the electrode, a resistance, second adsorption type, C2, blah, 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 blah. And then you end up with this kind of transmission line model. And the impedance of this transmission line model can be explained by this cotangent uh, of a frequency equation. And obviously, at low frequency here, this transmission line model impedance is infinite, it's a blocking electrode, and at high frequency, uh, everything is short-circuited so that you only measure the bulk electrolyte resistance. So keep in mind that the porous network, whatever it is, can be described by a transmission line model. If it is a redox reaction, it's a redox material, you simply add a charge transfer here, uh, uh, resistance here in parallel to C. Okay. Now, we took a porous carbon. We, we coated this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, capton with porous carbon material. And this is a change of impedance of the electrode in air. So it's uh, no electrolyte, so it's a constant module, it's a resistance. And after immersion into EMI FSI electrolyte, this is here, the impedance change with a frequency. And still, if you remember, we still have two parallel branches, one ionic with a cotangent, uh, with a trans transmission line model impedance, and one electronic. And you can calculate for those two branches the admittance, why ionic and why electronic. And depending on the value using this model of these admittance branches, you can more or less know where you are more ion when the impedance is more driven by the ionic conductivity at low frequency and the electronic conductivity at high frequency, just by calculating using this model the uh, admittance branches of your electronic type. What you can see is that when you immerse this film into electrolyte at high frequency, here we have <coughs> we have a decrease of impedance. This is simply the ionic percolation which short circuits the resistance of the electrode, same as for the one kilo ohm resistance. And then when you decrease the frequency, well, we have a kind of uh, increase of the low frequency uh, resistance. This is more, more or less, uh, it can be due to the contact loss between the carbon grains, because in fact, what you do when you immerse into the electrolyte, you have a swelling of the electrode, so you may lose a bit contact so that the electronic resistance at low frequency of the electrode increase a bit. Okay. But the next step now was to make some AC measurement using the second channel during the polarization using the channel one. And what we did first, simply, we did, a, this is a cyclic voltammetry done by potential star number one, and we did some potential static experiments where we have recorded the AC in plane electrode impedance. These are the results at different potentials here. And we use this equivalent circuit. This is, again, the transmission line model and the bulk electrolyte resistance. This is ionic branch. Here, what you can see is that you have, for the electronic branch, the carbon bulk resistance. And here, you have the carbon contact grain impedance uh, model, model by a capacitance with the CPU in parallel with a resistance. Using this model, we were able to extract the ionic resistance, R1, and the electronic resistance from the carbon. What you can see is that with a potential, the ionic here percolation, the ionic resistance of the electrode in plane is more or less constant. However, there is a big change here in the electronic resistance of the carbon depending on the potential. And you see this uh, resistance uh, decreases I would say from when you close the PCC potential, you have decrease of resistance, decrease of resistance. What is interesting is that people uh, 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 
with the Volcker Pressers group, they made some in situ dilatometry measurement of the same electrode in the same electrolyte. And they observed that from PCC to negative charge, there was a volume expansion of the electrode. From PCC to positive charge, a volume expansion of the electrode. So what we can say is that the electronic resistance trend follows the volume expansion. So we could say that the change of resistance in the carbon electrode is associated with the volume expansion during anion and cation adsorption. However, if you remember what we have shown for, for the graphene with much of the plot and so on, we show that there was also, when you cross the PCC, a change between N and P conductivity type. So we cannot exclude that we may have also a change of resistance because of a charge injection dropping when you cross the PCC. So I will say that the electronic change, resistivity change of the porous carbon during polarization can be due to both volume change, as shown here, and or to doping. Now, we place the porous carbon by muxine. And I show you before what was muxine. And these are the results. If you take the impedance of the muxine electrode in air, in plane impedance, there is obviously a constant resistance. But after immersion in one mole per liter of sulfuric acid electrolyte, there is no impedance change. And the reason is very easy to understand. Why? Because those muxines are highly conducting. It means that the electrical conductivity of muxines can go beyond 5,000 Siemens per centimeter. So it means that, in fact, all the ionic branch is short-circuited because of a very low resistivity of a muxine. And then you end up with something which is exactly the same. And we did the same. This is a cyclic voltammetry. We did some constant uh, potential polarization experiment. And we have calculated, oh, sorry, we have recorded the uh, uh, change of the modules versus the impedance. And we have extracted the change of resistance versus the potential. And this is the change of the electrical resistance of muctin here versus the potential. And this is a paper, which is from Yuri Gagatsi's group. They show that the C lattice parameter of muctin was changing in this way. The minimum was more or less, because it's not the same uh, reference electrode. Huh? But what we can say here is that the minimum of resistance is obtained under the peak. The minimum of C lattice parameter was also obtained under the peak. So we may see here a correlation between the minimum resistance and the minimum distance between the 2D layers of muxine. So the resistance, electrical resistance of the muxine, we suppose that it, uh, it follows, I would say, the change of interlayer distance in sulfuric acid. Next step was to move to battery materials. And these are uh, non published results. So this is a, we use the NVPF. NVPF is this material, NA3V2PO4 twice F3. And this material is a positive electrode for sodium ion battery. Okay, we use potential star number one, and we have run some galvanostatic charge discharge cycles. You can see here, for instance, this plateau here corresponds to the uh, intercalation of one sodium into the NVPF here, vanadium plus four, vanadium plus three, uh, sorry, vanadium, uh, two vanadium between three and four. And the second plateau here is the intercalation of the second sodium to reach third free sodium with vanadium plus three, uh, NF3, V2, PO4, 2, F3. And you have expected, I would say, two phase plateau with two different plateaus. This is a plus four and a mixed valency oxide on the vanadium and plus uh, mixed valency oxide plus plus three. Okay, fine. This is exactly the expected voltammetry, uh, static. Now, with a second potential star, we came to make some AC impedance measurement, but we didn't do AC because, in fact, it was a galvanostatic cycling plot. So we ran some operando measurement at constant current, DC. So this is the low frequency resistance, which corresponds to the in plane electrical, electronic resistance of the electrode. And these are the changes. What you can see is that we have some changes of resistance here between the two different two phase uh, systems. This was expected. But surprisingly, <laughs> you see, we see a big changes of resistance in the plateaus corresponding where nothing happened from the electrochemical point of view. 
So how can we explain that? This was a paper published by uh, Christian Mascoli in 2015, and they did some synchrotron study of NVPF. So this is the potential versus number of sodium, uh, one sodium, three sodium, and they did some constant uh, DITT, it's called, uh, it's a, I would say, a, a, a constant uh, a current, uh, I would say, a, a characterization, a synchrotron. What they found here is that in this first, during this first plateau here, you see, there was here, uh, sorry, I will say here, during the surf plateau, there was a superstructure for a specific composition, Na2.4. They found by Synchroto, obviously, by that here you see the, the change between the two plateaux. This is sodium 2, sodium 3. And here, in the middle of this plateau, they found by, still by Synchrotron the existence of a solid solution in the two phase domain, which was between X from 1.2 to x to 1.7. And if you overlap the change of the operando, the resistance we measured operando with our technique in the plane of the electrode, you can see that all these structural changes nicely overlap with uh, our resistance change. And it seems that the in-plane electronic conductivity measurements that we have, the changes follow the structural changes of the NVPF. But there is this we don't need obviously synchrotron to to do that, but it seems that our this technique is sensitive enough to track those very tiny changes that you can only track by synchrotron experiments. And the last example I want to show you is the one dealing with LiFPO4. So lithium FPO4 is a very popular and famous lithium uh, cathode, lithium ion battery cathode. So you start from uh, here, you start from, uh, for, for the charge, you start from uh, LiFPO4, you remove LA lithium, you go to uh, FPO4, and when you discharge, you move from FPO4, you intercalate lithium, and reach LiFPO4. A lot of people have shown that in this region here, it's a two-phase region. This is a uh, FPO4 in equilibrium with uh, LiF, um, uh, sorry, uh, LiFPO4, I apologize, this, this should be bold. LiFPO4, FPO4. But and they also noticed, and Matskoli and many others, the existence of uh, two, I would say, solid solutions. Two solid solutions here when you are uh, very uh, fully delicated between X0 and X0.05. You have a solid solution between uh, uh, of uh, FAPO4 and lithium in FAPO4. And you are at a highly lithiated stage between 0.85 and 1, or high X. Then you also have a solid solution here in this region. So two-phase plateau and solid solution, solid solution. Okay. What could be the resistance change of this uh, material in plane resistance change during cycling? But if you consider that the resistance, resistivity or resistivity of uh, FAPO4 is less than LiFAPO4, we should observe something like that. When you start from FAPO4, the in-plane resistance, electrical resistance, should increase. And then, in the way back, when you do the delifiation, you should decrease. Okay. Let's compare with the res with, uh, results we, we got with our operando method. Again, it's a DC, DC measurement, so it means that we track only the electro electronic resistance. The electronic resistance here, you see, increases when you delifiate up, you decrease, and then it decreases back during deviation. So it seems that you have a lot of variations of uh, change of resistance in the solid solution regions in the green lines. But also within the biphasic domain, there is an increase of resistance between charge and discharge. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. And a third point which is important is that there is a kind of asymmetry in the mechanism, why? Because at the same state of charge, if you go for deliciation or lithiation, there is you 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 don't have the same potential. So it's this is an asymmetry during the system. So it's not the expected trend. Is it due to the presence of a solid solution? Is it a, a, what happened? So what we did was to try to scan here in the short solid solution range at very low. Rate and how to do that? You cannot do that by galvanostatic because you go very fast, uh, very fast. Uh, you fastly reach the plateau. We did some cyclic voltammetry. We did some cyclic voltammetry using specific equipment at very low scan rate. It took three. It's ten microvolt per second, not fifty. So it's ten microvolt per second. 
And these are the two solid solutions domain, and this is the expected TV for the LFP. When you measure with the potential star number two, the change of resistance, what you end up with is this plot where you see that you have this first a decrease of resistance in charge and discharge and increase in charge. So it's more or less what we expected, but also the resistance changes during the whole charge discharge process. And then we transform this R versus potential into R versus X by integrating the charge. And what you see is that the main trend is respected compared to the what we have expected for galvanostatic cyclic. We have an increase when you do the lithiation and decrease when you do the delication, but there is still this kind of asymmetry in charge and discharge. A lot of things happen uh, in, 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 during the, the, the lithium removal intercalation. But if we compare now the galvanostatic and the, uh, I would say, cyclic voltammetry, the results are consistent, are, con are consistent. Still, we see that we have things occurring in the solution, solid solution uh, domains, but this perfectly fits what was published by Peter Novak in 2013. Uh, Peter Novak, in fact, explained this kind of uh, a shape for potentially the solid solution like model here that you can see here by uh, the multi, the many particle model uh, where particles of different size can see potential gradient heterogeneities. And then it seems that these changes could be linked with this kind of potential gradient distribution of particles, but this depends on the kinetics in the solid solution region because you see when you go fast in the solid solution the resistance is very high when you go low the resistance is strongly decreased okay so uh this it seems that this technique can really uh help in identifying all the tiny changes you have in two-phase system and solid solution the next step i'm not going to uh to uh to comment a lot on that is to use this technique for uh, solid state batteries uh, uh, composites Okay, so this is the end of my talk. It's about uh, uh, 14.02, maybe, maybe two minutes ahead of the schedule. But I would like to take a couple of minutes to thank uh, uh, a lot of people. Prof. Rigo Garcia, obviously, for wonderful collaboration. Prof. Marcus Antonetti, we, we have a, an ERC grant together, working on these amazing things of, uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, concept of energy storage in 3D materials and uh, designing passive layers on material. Professor Li Zifong at Shihuan University, Professor Ching Huang, and uh, as a Professor Hui Chao, which uh, uh, were uh, also uh, highly involved in this work. Uh, this is the group at Toulouse University. Uh, so this is uh, my colleague Caruta Berna, who is an uh, electrochemist, electrochemist, chemist, sorry. This is my colleague Barbara Dafos, and uh, we have Céline Merle, who is expert uh, uh, in electro, in uh, sorry, modeling, Barbara in, uh, in uh, electrochemistry. And the Patrick Rosier is missing. And all this uh, bunch of young, uh, talented guys that you can see, uh, can see with us. So these are uh, very, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, all these guys for uh, the hard work and all the previous uh, people who, who, who did work into my group. And I forgot to mention the group of uh, Professor uh, Yan Muzu, I mentioned before from uh, USTC. And the last slide is about a kind of uh, uh, short advertising for the energy storage materials uh, uh, journal. The editor in chief is Professor Huming Peng from uh, Class China. Uh, I'm, uh, I have the pleasure and the honor to serve as a co-editor in chief with him. And uh, uh, we are welcoming uh, uh, high quality papers on energy storage materials. Uh, journal is quite uh, quite a good uh, impact factor, and you see a bunch of uh, brilliant co-editors. And I would like to uh, to uh, stop uh, after 15 minutes by thanking you a lot for your attention. And uh, I'm uh, open for questions if you have some. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much uh, for the spectacular lecture, uh, Patrice. Uh, so uh, now it's time to uh, introduce uh, the uh, Katniss scientists that uh, accept the invitation to be member of the panel list and also our ex challenger of today. Uh, let me. Uh, show you again uh, uh, who these people are. So let's introduce them one by one. Uh, we can start actually from the very right uh, with uh, our uh, East Challenger. Uh, our East Challenger is uh, Professor Jamie Lee. Jamie Lee is a professor in, in the College of Electronic and Optical Engineering 
and College of Flexible uh, Electronics uh, in Nanjing University of Post and Telecommunication in Nanjing, in China. Uh, he received his bachelor and PhD degrees in material science from Donghua University. Uh, he has been visiting professor, is visiting student in the group of Yuri Gogosin Drexel University in 2018, and he had uh, a postdoc in uh, uh, National University of Singapore in 2020 uh, before taking over his professorship uh, back in China. So his research interests uh, are in flexible uh, optical modulation devices, including the visible light infrared tetraers, uh, waves and microwaves for broad applications such as smart closing, uh, flexible electronics, energy and others. He has published uh, over 30 papers in top journal, including niche communication energy, advanced energy materials, nano energy, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, this is our first, uh, uh, is our ex-challenger of today. Uh, we also have uh, three members of our uh, panelists. The first one is Professor Hui Ming Chen, uh, uh, who uh, got graduated, uh, oops, who got, Hui uh, Ming Chen got graduated Hunan University, so sorry, we jumped already to Yuri in the slides. Uh, he got graduated in Hunan University in China in 1984 and received a PhD in 1992 from Institute of Metal Research at the Chinese Academy of Science. He is director of uh, both the Advanced Carbon Research Division of the Sharing National uh, Laboratory of Material Science uh, since 2001 and the Institute of Technology of Carbon Neutrality Faculty of material science and energy uh, engineering in the Shenzhen Institute of Advanced Technology, uh, which is also a member of the Academy of Science. This is uh, since more recent 2001. He's a member of the Chinese Academy of Science and fellow of the TIVAS. Uh, he's also used uh, to work with the Kyushu Research Center of IST and Nagashi University in Japan uh, that happened in the 90s, uh, as well as he has been working uh, in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT in US. His research activities uh, are mainly focused on uh, the uh, energy storage devices uh, and materials, and uh, photocatalytic uh, materials, carbon nanotubes, graphene, and other two dimensional materials. He published over uh, 850 papers with a huge H index of uh, over 150, and uh, is highly cited in the field of chemistry, environmental ecology, and material science. Uh, he gave many plenary lectures and various uh, conferences. Uh, he won uh, many awards. Uh, so three state natural science award in China, uh, the Charles Petinos Award from the American Carbon Society, the Phelps Award uh, in the German system, and then ACS Nano Lecture Award uh, more recently. Uh, he also has a, a span of several high tech company uh, he has been editor of Carbons uh, from 2000 to 2015 and is editor-in-chief of New Carbon Materials. Uh, and uh, more recently, as we heard in the Patrice lecture, is editor-in-chief in energy storage material. Uh, the, second, uh, the second panelist that we have is uh, indeed Professor Yuri Gogosi from uh, uh, Drexel University, a distinguished professor at Drexel University. And, uh, uh, and is professor of materials engineering, uh, materials science engineering. He also serves as director of the Drexel Center of, uh, of Nanomaterial. Uh, he's uh, received uh, his uh, master and PhD uh, from uh, Kiev Polytechnic University, and uh, uh, he's also his uh, DSC degrees from Ukrainian Academy of Science in 1995. Uh, he is well known for his work on uh, to the uh, carbides, uh, on uh, nanostructural carbons and uh, other nanomaterials for energy, water, and biomedical application. He has been a highly cited researcher in chemistry and material science uh, for many years and also uh, uh, for physics. Uh, he received numerous awards, uh, and uh, so the list is extremely long. Uh, for example, uh, he has been, uh, he received a friendship award from uh, China, the European Carbon Association Award, the SOMIA Award from the International Union of Materials uh, 
Research Society, the Fred Carvey Distinguished Lectureship in, nanochem in Nanotechnology uh, from the MRS, uh, American MRS, the International Nanotechnology Prize, Ras Prize, uh, Ras Nano Prize that is shared indeed with Patrice, the R&D 100 awards, and so on and so forth. He was elected as fellow of the European Academy uh, of Science of the American Association of Advanced Science, uh, so AAS, of MRS, of the American Ceramic Society, of the Trochemic Society, Royal Chemi Society of Chemistry, uh, and the International Society of Electrochemistry, as well as Academician of the World Academy of Ceramics. He also on uh, honorary doctorates from different European universities, and he also has been uh, acting as a uh, Associate Editor of ACS Nano. And actually, last but not least, the third panelist that we have is Alice Zhang. Alice Zhang is the founder of this uh, Econix lecture. You are hearing from her uh, doing this fantastic uh, activity that has gathered many top uh, uh, nanoscientists around the world, which uh, only for this uh, fantastic work, she deserves a big electronic applause from all of us. And with this, I like to start uh, with a discussion. And so the X Challenger uh, is his turn uh, to uh, come up with his first questions to our uh, distinguished speaker. So please. Okay, so it's my turn. Uh, yes, thank please. Okay, uh, thank you, Paula, for the introduction. And uh, thanks, uh, Professor Zhang, for the uh, invitation. Thanks. Uh, Patrice for the impressive and the remarkable speak. Uh, actually, I read many of your uh, papers to grow up do, 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 during my PhD. Uh, yes, yeah, so in, in some case, in, in some case, you are also my supervisor, <laughs> like uh, Yuri. So uh, actually, I have uh, three questions, but uh, I can also uh, ask uh, two first, and uh, then uh, give the chance to other people and. Uh, if there is a, uh, enough time, I can ask the third one. Uh, so the first uh, question uh, should be asked for uh, the young researchers working on the supercapacitors, uh, like me. Uh, so uh, from the beginning of the century, so many kinds of materials, electrolytes have been prepared and uh, used in the supercapacitors, like uh, carbon materials, uh, oxides, magazines, you, just like you talk, uh, so the, the series are also becoming more and more improved. Uh, but I noticed uh, that in the recent years, more and more uh, capacitor-related papers include the advanced uh, in-situ characterizations. However, uh, most of the researchers, uh, especially the young researchers, don't have the chance to use the instruments. Uh, also, the applications of supercapacitors super is uh, uh, a big challenge. So. Here, uh, I would like to know your suggestions for the large group of young, normal researchers working on supercapacitors uh, like me. Uh, what should we do to uh, organize our lab and study to keep our work fresh and or useful? Yeah. Now, this is a very, very good, very excellent question. Um, so obviously, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a very uh, the answer, but I will say I will start by saying something. Is that, you know, the big equipments, access to large and small is something. But what is really interesting, what is really important, is to try to use the techniques you have. You see what you can do with not ex highly uh, quite inexpensive techniques like EQCM, like thinking about designing this operando in plane. Uh, uh, impedance spectroscopy. So what my recommendation will be first before trying to see. Uh, oh, I cannot have access to this. What do you have? You have a panel of electrochemical characterization techniques. And what you could, what you can try to do is by thinking how to use at the maximum, the, at the, to push the use of these techniques really to the, to the end to try to really find, uh, or be able to run some uh, electrochemical, uh, I mean, to experiments with a nanometer resolution. Like, like, uh, for instance, the first part of my talk, I did not, I mean, I did not use any synchrotron experiment. I did not show any synchrotron. I did not show any uh, uh, very expensive uh, technique and so on. Only electrochemistry, but obviously trying to think a little bit outside the box and trying to push those techniques first to their limit. This is a fir my first recommendation. 
then if you really need to access to go to synchrotron facilities and so on, I mean, the best thing is collaborative network. And I think that you were in a super excellent good place in the world where you, where you, you, you had a mentor who talked to you. I, I'm pretty sure that how important are collaborations, you see? And a scientist in, in chemistry alone cannot do anything now. The, the key point is the collaboration. You're going to be expert on everything. So I would recommend to establish a collaborative network where you could try to benefit from synchrotron access or equipment and so on through your, your network. These are my two recommendations. First, push the tech, use the techniques you have and push them to the maximum by trying to uh, design smart experiments. And second, collaboration. Okay, thank you. Actually, you also told me that uh, we could be, uh, we should keep uh, active and uh, to go out to talk, talk with the experts and uh, uh, introduce ourselves and uh, try to co collaborate with, with them. <laughs> yeah, but I, it's I, true I, that the, the recent pandemia did the recent pandemia did not help in the in specifically in that topic and it cut a bit. Uh, the collaboration, but now this is a time now to to uh, to strengthen, re-strengthen the link between uh, between uh, groups and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Also, thank you. Uh, so the, the the second question, uh, uh, I switched uh, part of my research to the optical modulation per performance of Maxine uh, toward the visible uh, infrared and the microwaves from uh, twenty eighteen in, in Yuri's lab. Uh, so, Yuri and Mika also published an uh, interesting work that controlled the EMS shielding performance by electrochemical re reaction. Uh, I am also doing a similar work for years, uh, maybe from uh, 20, 2021. Uh, so, we found some interesting results, but the progress was uh, slow because of the COVID 19. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, Hope I can share the results with you in the near future. Uh, so uh, there are also many uh, electrochemical processes during the modulation of the light with the different uh, the, uh, wavelengths. So uh, I want to ask you for the strategy in this field, how to explore the uh, electrochemistry and improve the performance. Uh, if the techniques you use the it's also uh, can can be used in in this field. Yeah, um, um, I, I think so. And I'm, you see the the uh, operand or uh, measurement of the uh, ionic or electronic percolation uh, uh, in the electrodes. I think that could be uh, quite interesting to, I mean, just to have a look on that uh, on this one under uh, UV or under light or whatever you want. So I think this is something. Especially for for the magnetic for the electrical uh, for the shielding sorry for the EMI shielding I think this, this is something super important to uh, really characterize obviously the, uh, the electrical percolations in the electrode but that could be also interesting because I know that you are doing a lot of work in Yuri's lab with UV with plasmons and so on and so on uh, I would be very curious to try to combine those two methods and see how these electrical performance are influenced uh, by by the uh, by light irradiation or, or, or stuff like that but I think that again. I go back to my first point. Uh, when you when you just try to to design some some smart, I would say it's, no, not smart, but just try to use what you have in your in your lab, the, all the conventional electrochemical techniques, and try to push them at their maximum. Try to combine the techniques to try to uh, 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 to have a, uh, to I would say to 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 reach a better to make a better characterization of of, of a material. This echoes the, the first point, but yes. Combining the uh, AC impedance and uh, and uh, your uh, your uh, uh, your experiments and our light and so on will be quite interesting, to my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so maybe I can see see the third question or just yeah, go ahead. You can ask the third question. I will say. Okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, the the third question maybe not uh, are so re related to the electrochemistry. Uh, so the, the hottest topic in the world recently should be the news of a chat GPT. Uh, the, the AI is growing rapidly. So the, the machines are very smart and uh, tireless. They almost know everything on the internet as well the, as the uh, uh, experiments, theories, and uh, they can also very good at uh, summarization, calculations, and uh, ma mathematics. For now, the AI is uh, only a tool. 
that we can use to help the uh, help it work, work more efficiently. But uh, do you think they could uh, replace the scientists and theorists? Even uh, maybe replace me, replace uh, even you and uh, even uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> so, uh, uh, can you uh, can we uh, prepare to avoid being replaced by the uh, AI and the, maybe uh, just uh, use it like a, a, a tool? So this is a very also again very interesting question. It's like a philosophical debate, I would say. But I'm quite optimistic. I will say that I see the artificial intelligence today. This is clearly, clearly the case. Today, you can ask ChatGPT, ask a question to ChatGPT. Okay, can you please uh, uh, give me the context of lithium ion batteries? It's gonna, it's gonna be super fun. It's gonna give you a very nice introduction, contextualization of, uh, and so on. Then, try to ask to ChatGPT to uh, prepare a research program on uh, two D materials like Maxine. You will see that. Today, nothing, it will not be, he will not be able, or it will not be able to do it. And I'm pretty sure that even in, uh, in the future, the artificial intelligence like ChatGPT will, can, will not replace the human intelligence because uh, one thing is to treat the data, but another thing is to have a very, uh, uh, I would say, human look at the data. And again, preparing a, res a research proposal uh, by, uh, I would say, making co connections to things, not, not only... Uh, Connecting the things simply by mathematics, algorithm, and so on, but because of your knowledge and because you know which uh, characterization and, and I mean which material characterization, what, what makes sense, uh, I think that no, ChatGPT or uh, IA will not will never replace the the the, uh, the human beings. But I may be a bit too optimistic. But today this is clearly the case, and uh, uh, I think I see the ChatGPT and the, no, Chad, we don't care about ChatGPT, but. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence more as an opportunity for scientists compared to uh, uh, a threat because uh, it will help us a lot in uh, uh, obviously we've been maybe in 10 years we will, not, we will not have to write any more of the introductions of papers definitely but the science of the papers still mm -hmm. okay this is my view okay we could make we should right. make me because fresh right <laughs> thank you very much John Min. Uh, now we pass to the Thanks, first uh, uh, panelist, that is uh, Professor Hui Ming Cheng. Please. Uh, Professor Cheng, you're mute. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good evening and uh, uh, probably good morning for. Patrice, <laughs> good noon. <laughs> uh, yeah, so very nice talk. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, in particular, the electrochemistry is uh, very deep and uh, comprehensive. So, uh, Patrice, I, uh, I have a question for you. So, I, I, I do like uh, the last part uh, you uh, <coughs> re uh, reported the developed the uh, imprint uh, impedance measurement. This is uh, very nice. But my question is, uh, and you gave me, you gave us a few uh, nice examples, but uh, I would like to know what is the best situation for using this uh, technique? I would say that uh, maybe I can, maybe I will answer uh, using a different approach, I would say that uh, when you prepare an electrode for for a battery, you know that all these guys from in in companies they are formulating their their film, they are coating their film onto uh, aluminum and copper current collectors. What is really important is that they try to put as much as as sorry as less as binder as possible, as less as conducting agent as possible because these are dead weight. I would say, and this is how this kind of technique can help in optimizing the electrode formulation because in uh, the, the, the electronic and ionic percolation the electrodes of batteries are supposed to be homogeneous in length and thickness okay so when you use this in plane uh, i would say uh, in plane uh, uh, technique then you can and emphasize what happens on the section of the electrode out of plane which is what that, what works in the battery electrode because you have a current collector and I think there you can really track some really tiny details. Tiny, you can you can have access to to tiny de details to optimize the electrode formulations uh, from a non-material. Then, 
if you if, if it comes to a selection of materials by the inset, as I show you with LFP, with LFP, we see this kind of important change in the resistance during the cycling. I'm pretty yeah. sure that this comes from the particle size distribution. You have small size particles, big particles, and potential gradients on top of a solid solution. So this can be a way also to help people in designing the best material in terms of granulometry and the best electrolyte in terms of formulation. Did I did I address your point? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So I would say that this is not only a way to uh, simply characterize what happens live in the materials, but also can be a practical tool for, for people who are building real batteries or super caps. So do, do, and do you think it's possible to develop a standard equipment for using this technology? For example, the company guy can use it, and also the master students can use it, something like that. And this is this is a really uh, <laughs> super good question because what we try we try to optimize the design now uh, because obviously we are doing something in the lab. I'm not saying that we have plans to uh, to propose something commercially com that can be commercialized, but we try to optimize the design to end up with a cell which is more convenient to uh, uh, to use. And yes, the answer is yes. This is what we would like to do to have a kind of uh, a very flexible design that you can use to directly measure. Uh, you, you see, you take the electrode right after the, the production line, you put a, a square of electrodes, and then you put it, you, you add the electrolyte, and you measure it. That will be the uh, the best situation, I would say. This is something that will, this is the direction we would like to go, uh, but it's going to take a bit of time because we need to optimize everything. But I think yes, this technique thank is, you is a really good. Thanks, Professor Thank you a lot. That's very Thanks. great. Thank you. Truly appreciate it. Okay, Paul. Uh, I, I only have this uh, questions and the discussion. Perfect. Thank you, Rui Ming. Thank you very much. Now we pass to the next uh, member of the panel list, that is Professor Yuri Gogosi. Yuri, the floor is yours. Your. Uh, thank you, Paolo. Uh, Patrice, I enjoyed the talk. I also really like uh, the technique that you developed, that you showed as the last part of the talk. And I think actually uh, following up also on uh, uh, Jen Min Lee's uh, question, it's exactly, for example, this change in the conductivity can connect uh, uh, electrochemical modulation of uh, in a EMI shielding and other properties. So I think it's a very fundamental technique that allows us to understand what happens with electrodes here. But I would like to uh, take a discussion into somewhat different direction, uh, talking about a general balance of energy in electrochemistry. You work on both battery supercapacitors and mm -hmm. fundamental electrochemistry. And one thing people uh, talk little about is how much energy is lost when we charge, discharge batteries. How much heat uh, need to be, for example, uh, dissipated and complex uh, cooling systems in the current battery, car battery sinks here. And the question is here, how can we minimize energy losses? Like, for example, supercapacitors here. Is it purely fundamental that whenever you have redox, you will have a uh, large energy loss in a cycle? Can it be increased by controlling materials used and storage mechanisms? What do you think about it? Yeah, this is a very complex question because I, I will maybe start to start with something important I forgot to mention is that uh, uh, I'm talking to all the students who are who are listening is that currently we are we are enjoying a, a very uh, unique and exciting period of uh, uh, for people for, for for me and for other guys who are working in the, in the battery energy storage field because the topic is so so hard that uh, there are a lot of opportunities for for young brilliant scientists to to join companies or to join. To get a high, uh, I mean, academic positions at top level. Now, once that said, this is a very hot topic: how to dissipate the heat in batteries. Definitely. So there, are in in the in some cars, you have even heat heat pumps uh, to try to dissipate this. Why? Simply because, in fact, you have an internal service resistance in a battery. Definitely. And this is why batteries they don't operate at P max at the maximum power. Why? Just because, in fact, at this maximum power. 
the definition is that if you do the, uh, the mathematical uh, uh, equation of the Kirchhoff law, you find that the maximum power is reached when the load resistance, the resistance of the load, is the same as the internal resistance of the battery. So it means that half of the energy is lost in heat inside the battery. So the first way to limit this kind of uh, energy dissipation is to decrease, to, to work at uh, two-thirds of the maximum power. And more or less, this is, this is what batteries are doing. Then, as soon as you have an internal resistance, then you have uh, energy efficiency, which is less than 100%, because you have a polarization. On top of uh, electrochemical polarization and charge and discharge, you add the ohmic polarization. And obviously, to minimize this uh, polarization and to improve energy efficiency, you have to decrease the ohmic drops. And this is the key. Uh, uh, this is why I was mentioning about the electrical percolation, not only within the, the grain, but within the electrode, which is the key, again, to limit the, the heat dissipation. And uh, uh, so, so this is, uh, these are mainly these two, these two points. Um, we can we can prepare the best material we 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 want as soon as we have a charge transfer reaction we have a charge transfer resistance and this resistance will definitely add to the ohmic to the ohm I mean to the ohmic resistances but in a battery when under operation the uh, most of the resistance maybe uh, two thirds of the resistance or even more is simply not the electrochemical resistance from charge transfer, but the ohms the ohmic resistances so the key is decreasing again the uh, ohmic percolations inside the, the, the electrodes. Did I did I uh, answer your, your, your point, Yuri? Uh, yes, uh, maybe also here. So fundamentally, we need more conducting materials. Yep. We need lower charge transfer resistance, and we need to ensure that we have percolation across the uh, electrodes on micro and macro scale. And highly conductive materials. I'm not the best uh, the best person to uh, to 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 <laughs> to say that because you are the you discovered muxine with extremely high conductivity and you can see how the electrical conductivity of the active material is important. Uh, this is simply the uh, the measurements we made operando when, when when you see that there is no change when you put a muxine electrode from air to the electrolyte there is no change in resistance because thanks to the high conductivity of muxine. So yes. The conductivity, electrical conductivity of a material is very important. And on top, the electrochemical, uh, the, sorry, electronic percolation inside the electrode and ionic is also important. Uh, and can I add uh, a few words? Hello? Sure, sure. sure. Okay. So uh, actually, Yuri pointed out uh, a very good, uh, I think, uh, a very good uh, uh, aspect. Uh, so for uh, for electronic uh, uh, consumers, uh, electronic devices, uh, we don't, uh, how I say, we don't take too much attention on the power efficiency because we don't use much uh, electricity for this kind of um, uh, devices. And for even for uh, uh, electric vehicle, we haven't considered too much about the power efficiency. However, when we know working more on large scale battery for energy storage, for example, for grid energy storage, the power efficiency is very important. We have to consider this aspect because if we lose 1% for this large scale grid energy storage, that means a grid knows for for the for the energy, so right now for those uh, for working on um, energy storage batteries uh, or devices, we have to consider the power efficiency. Yeah, absolutely agree uh, with uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, may I ask another question? Sure. Um, uh, Patrice, you mentioned all this gigafactory being built. And of course, uh, pretty much people around the world use the same uh, architecture, uh, use the same approach. And I know it's very difficult to change it exactly because multi-billion dollar investments are being made, mega yes. factory are being built here. But do you see an opportunity for developing different, better, better architectures, three-dimensional others, at least at 
other alternative energy storage, like distributed electronics, uh, like uh, uh, conformal structural battery things here. Uh, what is the room for this type of development, basically designing a better battery? Um, th there are two points in your in your question. The first, I will start by by maybe uh, answering the the easiest uh, part, which is the battery. So Giga factories they build cells, mm -hmm. and then you assemble people. I mean, other manufacturers integrate the cells in the battery, and the battery now the integration of the battery can be cell to module to battery, can be cell to battery, or can even now be cell to chassis. Means what? Set of chassis mean that the batch, the cells are glued together and mm -hmm. are uh, make the rigidity of a, the vehicle chassis. Mm -hmm. And depending on this kind of integration level, you can increase the watt hour per kilogram or per liter of the battery, of the packed battery, by 50%. Not talking at all about material science, just by technology. So a first way to uh, I would say improve uh, 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 the flexibility of the, on, the, on, the, on the design of the battery uh, is, uh, I mean, th this is already done because gigafactories, they, most of them, they only assemble the cells and they sell the cells to assemblers so that they build the battery. The second point, uh, in fact, when you ask the question, you, you gave the answer. As long as your battery or your materials cannot be processed today in a lithium ion battery production line is going to be very difficult because, as you mentioned, billions of investment for building these big factories with a process which is uh, really uh, more or less the same everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, lithium ion batteries are going to move a little bit, a little by little, to solid states, but it's not a big change in the in the process in the electrode fabrication. It may be thirty percent uh, of a line will be adapted, but if you want, let's take the example. I don't know. For uh, accused zinc batteries, accused zinc batteries, uh, it might be a bit difficult now to uh, to to launch a gigafactories of accused zinc batteries because zinc air batteries, sorry, because it's not the same technology, you see. And um, so this is, to my opinion, this might be a, a problem. It may, I will say, it might be difficult to develop a kind of alternative technology to lithium ion or lithium metal solid state batteries, if the assembly process is not compatible with a lithium ion technology. Sodium ion battery is not in this case because sodium ion can be a copy and paste and transferred to lithium ion uh, 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 production lines. But uh, this is a very important point that you highlighted. And unfortunately, um, based on all these investments, I'm a bit pessimistic uh, for a, a, a new system to come within the, the next, uh, I would say, five years. Then once this kind of Peak will be will have been passed because we everybody is uh, enthusiastic and wants to build his own cigar factory. Then maybe there will be it will be time to to try to develop uh, uh, the, the the large scale production of other uh, alternative technology. But so far, uh, it seems that uh, uh, for energy cost and, uh, uh, and power ratio, the lithium based technology is still uh, still ahead. Thank you, Patrice. Thanks, Yuri. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, I must say, it, it's a bit pessimistic, your answer, Patrice. Uh, but uh, I'll try to no. look at things in a bit more <laughs> optimistic way. Uh, I mean, the, if you think that there are also new applications that will be requested by the market, uh, then the, the fabrication approaches need to be to change. Because no, everything that is compliant, for example, was not foreseen uh, one decade ago. I, I agree, Paolo. What I just wanted to highlight is that uh, the word gigafactory, I mean, having the same kind of uh, huge invest investment in the technology, which is different from lithium, might be difficult. But obviously, you will have some plans for producing uh, uh, over batteries, but not maybe at the same uh, world level as, as a lithium, uh, lithium battery currently is developing. But for the rest, I fully agree with you. Yeah. We need, we need new, new batteries. Absolutely. Alice, the floor okay, is yours. Okay, great. Actually, I, a lot, I learned a lot from your talk and uh, this discussion. Yeah, it's much deeper, you know, uh, let me think a lot because last Sunday, we just uh, have a debate. 
for this energy issues for you know even the grid you know even you know some new energies here i have a question is for like patrice huimi and yuri all of you are superstars in this field so yeah did you think about in the near future maybe 10 years or uh, or some 20 years, you know, yeah, what can uh, well be the big trend, you know, for the supercapacitors to replace the battery, all the battery all combined? Okay, so maybe Patrice, you go first. <laughs> I, I would say that uh, I, I'm not, uh, I don't think that supercaps will replace batteries, but supercaps will be always used as because supercaps, they, they are high power very nicely suited for high power application and high power application kills the batteries because batteries super difficult to fastly charge or fastly discharge uh, lithium lithium batteries so the specificity of supercaps is is that they can again uh, uh, they can deliver they can uh, uh, they can uh, withdraw peak powers and this makes a big difference as a complementary technique and now I would say that, you know, you start from, we started from carbon carbon. Now, with this muxine material, which are combining redox and, uh, and uh, also double ear and, and, and things like that, the confinement of ions. I would say that I see a kind of uh, uh, evolution of supercaps to high power devices as well, where you will have more energy than a carbon carbon device, but more uh, similar power performance. And this is what I was trying to show in my second or third slide using uh, uh, reaching this, this star. From the from the super cap uh, side by trying to use this kind of uh, solar capacitive like materials like muxines and, and other materials to really prepare high power devices so for me okay. there is a huge market for high power as well okay great in this high power that may dominate right <laughs> <laughs> how about your opinion on this so, <clears throat> Uh, you know, there are so many uh, uh, situations for using energy storage devices. For example, uh, as we know, we need uh, uh, devices for electrical uh, vehicles, we need devices for consumers, electronics, we need uh, devices for grid energy storage and also for distributed energy storage. So. I, I, it, it is difficult to say uh, something to replace something. <laughs> I think it, it's good for us to find the suitable place to have, to use <laughs> something. So I think that's more important. So, uh, super, for example, super capacitor is very good for high power, uh, situation, uh, right? But uh, for, yeah. For for great energy storage, we need low cost and the long life energy storage devices. Uh, mostly, at the same time, we also need high power devices, even for great energy storage. So we need to you know to combine all those uh, technologies together for uh, optimum application. Okay, super super nice. Yeah. So you're so of course, right. <laughs> we will develop some, some, uh, some more. Uh, we will develop some more uh, new technologies and, and new devices for mm -hmm. those kind of uh, applications as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I will build on what uh, Hui Ming uh, just uh, mentioned. Um, I envision the future as the world with smart devices surrounding us. We get smart houses, we get smart clothes where electronics is getting embedded, pretty much everything. And I actually see this as an opportunity for new materials, new architectures, new technologies. Because this is something where you cannot take a diesel and put uh, in a pocket uh, and power, uh, say, an antenna in your uh, jacket uh, or a smart display on a sleeve of your uh, short. And I think this is exactly where we need to look for new solutions because there is no accepted technology now. 
And this all Internet of Things, distributed devices, sensors, which need to be self-powered, where there is no room for a large casing and battery supercapacitor, depending on what kind of activity you need to do, for example, harvest energy quickly from fast process or power communication, have an opportunity. So my feeling, this is kind of a new era of devices embedded, printed, uh, micro scale will be emerging. So this is maybe something uh, next generation of technology here. In addition to this large scale grid storage and largely automotive and other standard batteries that current Kiha factories are addressing. So I think this is a future and I believe this is also where an opportunity for researchers who are working at the cutting edge of uh, electrochemistry, energy storage technology uh, is right now. Thank you so much, very much, Sylvie. Okay, Paulo, my question. Fantastic. I think that uh, the answer to this last question were really showing uh, the bright future that we have in front of us for electrochemistry in this case, but uh, more generally for materials and nanoscience. So with this, I'd like to thank the uh, the speaker, first of all, Patrice, for the amazing and insightful lecture of today. Uh, okay. I'd like to thank as well uh, our two pa uh, three panelists members and our ex challenger. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think it was a beautiful uh, beginning of the afternoon for us in, uh, in uh, Europe. And uh, with this, I'd like you to remind you uh, that uh, actually periodically, so next week, there is already another uh, Econix. Uh, let me just uh, publish this. Uh, it's uh, by Kyle Ketchpo. And uh, so you are, of course, uh, all invited uh, to take part to this. Uh, and uh, with this, I, again, an applause goes to Alice for setting up all this, uh, this very successful series. Uh, very insightful, and uh, I'd like to thank all the people that have been listening to us today and looking forward to meet you next week. Okay, great.不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界离我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗。I can, I can。我可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗奇迹，我拥有梦想，我。